simply limited in what you can do to deal with inflation? Well, look, uh, as you know, uh, Ken, um, the inflation has everything to do with the supply chain. And uh, I think what you're seeing is that we've been able to make progress on speeding up the access to materials. Uh, for, for example, one third of the, co- of the uh, uh, increase in cost of living is cost of automobiles. The reason automobiles have skyrocketed in price is because of the lack of computer chips. So we have the capacity and we're going to do everything in our power to do it to become self-reliant on the computer chips that we need in order to be able to produce more automobiles. That's underway. We've already passed within the context of another bill uh, money for that in the, uh, in the House of Representatives before the House of Representatives now. But I think there's a way we can move to if we can move to get, for example, that one thing done, it can make a big difference in terms of the cost of the total cost of, of living. Now, with regard to um, the whole issue of energy prices, um, that gets a little more complicated. But you saw what happened when I was able to convince everyone from including China, India, a number of other countries to agree with us to go into their version of the, of the, of the petroleum reserve to release more into the market. So that, that brought down the price about 12, 15 cents a gallon, some places, some places more. There's going to be a, there's going to be a reckoning along the line here as to whether or not we're going to continue to see oil prices continue to go up in ways that are going up now relative to what is going to, what impact that's going to have on the producers. And so um, it's going to be hard. I think that's the place where most middle class people, work class people get hit the most. They pull up to the pump and all of a sudden instead of paying $2.40 a gallon, they're paying $5 a gallon. That's going to be really difficult. But so we're going to continue to work on trying to increase oil supplies that are available. And I think there's ways in which we can be of some value added in terms of the price of gas, natural gas and the like to take the burden off the European countries that uh, are now totally dependent on, on Russia. But it's going to be hard. It's going to be very hard. But I think that we have to deal with, for example, like I said, you have a circumstance where people are paying more for a pound of hamburger meat than they ever paid. Well, one of the reasons for that is you don't have that many folks out there that are the ones that are got the big four controlling it all. And so you're going to see more and more, we're going to move on this competition piece to allow more and more smaller operations to come in and be able to engage in providing, buying and providing the access to much cheaper uh, meat uh, than, uh, than exists now. But it's going to be a haul. Now, and as you, I assume the reason you said if I can't get Build Back Better is, relates to what those uh, 17 Nobel laureate economists said, that if, in fact, we could pass it, it would actually lower the impact on inflation, reduce inflation over time, et cetera. So there's a lot we have to do. It's not going to be easy, but I think we can get it done. But it's going to be painful for a lot of people in the meantime. That's why the single best way, the single best way to take the burden off the middle class and working class folks is to pass the Build Back Better piece that are things that they're paying a lot of money for now. If you get to trade off higher gases, you're putting up with higher price of hamburgers and, and gas versus whether or not you're going to have to, you're going to be able to pay for uh, education and or um, uh, uh, child care and the like. I think most people would make the trade. Their bottom line would be better in middle class households. But it's going to be hard and it's going to take a lot of work. Well, sir, uh, you mentioned China. Do you think the time has come to begin lifting some of the tariffs on Chinese imports? Or is there a need for China to... to make due on some of its commitments in the phase one agreement. Some business groups would like you to begin raising, uh, lifting up those uh, tariffs. on. Well, I know that. And that's why my trade rep is working on that right now. The answer is uncertain. It's uncertain. I'd like to be able to be in a position where I could say they're meeting the commitments or more of the commitments and be able to lift some of it. But we're not there yet. Um, Nancy, uh, CBS. Thank you so much, Mr. President. This afternoon, the Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell said that the midterm elections are going to be a report card on your progress on inflation, border security, and standing up to Russia. Do you think that that's a fair way to look at it? And if so, how do you think that report card looks right now? I think report cards will look pretty good if that's where we're at. But look, the idea that uh, Mitch has been very clear. <laughs> He's do anything to prevent Biden from being a success. I, I, I get on with Mitch. I actually like Mitch McConnell. We like one another. But he has one straightforward objective. Make sure that there's nothing I do that makes me look good from the, in the mind, in his mind, with the public at large. And that's okay. I'm a big boy. I've been here before. But the fact is that I think that the, uh, I'm happy to debate and have a referendum on how I handle the economy, whether or not I've made progress on. When, look, again, can I, I'm taking too long answering your questions. I apologize. I think that the, the fundamental question is, what's Mitch for? What's he for on immigration? What's he for? What's he proposing? anything better. What's he for dealing with Russia? It's different than I'm proposing. Many of his Republican friends or his colleagues are supporting as well. What's he for on these things? What are they for? So everything's a choice. A choice. I think, they, look, I've laid out a proposal on immigration that if we passed it, we'd be in a totally different place right now. But we're not there because we don't have a single Republican vote. My buddy John McCain's gone. So, I mean, it's, it's just, it's going to take time. And again, I go back to, I, I go back to Governor Sununu's quote, how long, I mean, a rhetorical question. I don't, I know this is not fair to ask the press question. I'm not asking you. But think about 
Did you ever think that one man out of office could intimidate an entire party where they're unwilling to take any vote contrary to what he thinks should be taken for fear of being defeated in the primary? I've had five Republican senators talk to me, bump into me, quote unquote, or sit with me, who've told me that they agree with whatever I'm talking about for them to do. But Joe, if I do it, I'm going to defeat in the primary. We've got to break that. It's got to change. And I doubt you're all, I'm not being, it sounds like I'm being solicitous, you're all bright as hell, well-informed, more informed than any group of people in America. But did any of you think that you get to a point where not a single Republican would diverge on a major issue? Not one. Anyway. Can you tell us who those five Republican senators are? Sure. No, are you kidding me? <laughs> I, uh, I, I maintain confidentiality. Uh, on but I'm rights, sure you've spoken to some. <laughs> on voting rights, sir, yes. at your first press conference 10 months ago, I asked you if there was anything you could do beyond legislation to protect voting rights. And at that time, you said, yes, but I'm not going to lay out a strategy before you and the world now. Now that legislation appears to be hopelessly stalled, can you now lay out your strategy to protect voting rights? Well, I'm not prepared to do that in detail in terms of the executive orders I may be able to engage in and other things I can do. But one of the things we have done, we have, we have significantly beefed up the number of enforcers in the Justice Department who are there to challenge the, these, these unconstitutional efforts, in our view, unconstitutional efforts on the part of the Republicans to stack the election and subvert the outcomes. Uh, we have uh, begun to organize in ways that we didn't before the communities beyond the civil rights community to make the case to the rest of the American people what's about to happen, what will happen if, in fact, these things move forward. If I had talked to you, not you, I'm using you in a choice. If I've talked to the public about the whole idea of subversion of elections by deciding who the electors are after the fact, I think people would have looked at me like, whoa, I mean, I caught, taught constitutional law for 20 years, a three credit course in separation of powers, and uh, on Saturday mornings when I was a senator. And uh, I, I never thought we'd get into a place where, um, where we were talking about being able to actually, what they tried to do this last time out, send different electors to the state legislative bodies to represent who won the election, saying that I didn't win, but Republican candidate won. Um, I doubt what anybody thought that would ever happen in America in the 21st century, but it's happening. And so I think, I guess what I'm saying is, uh, Nancy, is that I think that uh, there are a number of things we can do, but I also think we will be able to get significant pieces of the legislation if we don't get it all now to build to get it so that we get a, a big chunk of the John Lewis legislation as well as the fair election. Sir, on COVID, if you don't mind, you touted the number of Americans who are now fully vaccinated with two shots, but even some of your own medical advisors say that people aren't fully protected unless they have that third shot, yeah. a booster. Why hasn't this White House changed the definition of fully vaccinated to include that third booster shot? Is it because the numbers of fully vaccinated Americans would suddenly look a lot less No, impressive? it's not that at all. It's just, it's just this, has be, this has become clearer and clearer. And every time I speak of it, I say, if you've been vaccinated, get your booster shot. Everybody get the booster shot. It's the, op the optimum protection you can have. You're protected very well with two shots. If it's the Pfizer, anyway, you're protected. But you are better protected with the booster shot. The definition right now. I'm following what the, the answer is yes, get the booster shot. It's all part of the same thing. You're better protected. Um, okay, uh, Alex, uh, Alper, Reuters. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I wanted to follow up briefly on a question asked by uh, Bloomberg. You said that Russia would be held accountable if it invades, and it depends on what it does. It's one thing if it's a minor incursion, and we end up having to fight about what to do and what not to do. Are you saying that a minor incursion by Russia into Ukrainian territory would not lead to the sanctions that you have threatened, or are you effectively giving Putin permission to make a small incursion into the country? <laughs> Good question. Um, that's how it did sound like, didn't it? The most important thing to do, big nations can't bluff, number one. Number two, the idea that we would do anything to split NATO, which would be a, have a profound impact on one of, I think, profound impact on one of Putin's objectives is to weaken NATO, would be a big mistake. So the question is, if it's a something significantly short of uh, a significant invasion, or not even significant, just major military forces coming across. For example, uh, it's one thing to determine that if they continue to, uh, to use cyber efforts. Well, we, we can respond the same way with cyber. Um, they have FSB people in Ukraine now trying to undermine uh, the solidarity within Ukraine about Russia and to try to promote Russian interests. Um, but it's very important that, uh, that we keep everyone in NATO on the same page. And that's what I'm spending a lot of time doing. And there are differences. There are differences in NATO as to what countries are willing to do depending on what happens, the degree to which they're able to go. And I want to be clear with you. The serious imposition of sanctions relative to dollar transactions and other things are things that are going to have a negative impact on the United States as well as a negative impact on the economies of Europe as well, a devastating impact on Russia. And so i got to make sure everybody's on the same page as we move along. 
I think we will if there's something that is, that where there's Russian forces crossing the border, killing Ukrainian fighters, et cetera. I think that changes everything. But it depends on what he does to see actually what extent we're going to be able to get total unity on the, Russia, on the uh, NATO front. If I may ask a quick one on Iran, I just wanted to get your sense of whether the Vienna talks are making any progress, if you still think it's possible to reach a deal for both sides to resume compliance with the Iran nuclear deal, or if it's time to give up on that. Thank you. I'll do it in reverse. It's not time to give up. There is some progress being made. The P5 plus one is on the same page, but it remains to be seen. Um, okay, uh, Kristen, NBC. Kristen. Um, very quickly on Russia, um, I do have a number of domestic policy issues, but on, on Russia very quickly, it seemed like you said that you have assessed, you feel as though he will move in. Has this administration, have you determined whether President Putin plans to invade or move into Ukraine, as you said? Look, um, the only thing I'm confident of is that decision is totally, solely, completely a Putin decision. Nobody else is going to make that decision. No one else is going to impact that decision. He's making that decision. And I suspect it matters which side of the bed he gets up on in the morning as to exactly what he's going to do. And I think it is not irrational, if he wanted to, to talk about dealing with strategic doctrine and dealing with force structures in Europe and in, in uh, the European parts of Russia. But I don't know whether he's decided he wants to do that or not. So far, in the three meetings we've had, OSCE, anyway, have, have not produced anything because the impression I get from my Secretary of State, my National Security Advisor, and my other senior officials that are doing these meetings is that there's a question of whether the people they're talking to know what he's going to do. So the answer is, uh, but based on a number of criteria as to what he could do, for example, for him to move in and occupy the whole country, particularly from the north from Belarus, it's, uh, he's going to have to wait a little bit until the ground's frozen so he can cross. To move in a direction where he wants to talk about what's going on, we, we we're continuing to provide for defense capacities to the, to the Ukrainians. We are talking about what's going on in both the uh, the Baltic and the Black Sea, et cetera. There's a whole range of things that I'm sure he's trying to calculate how quickly he can do what he wants to do and what does he want to do. But I, he's not, he's an informed individual. And I'm sure, I'm not sure, I believe he's calculating what the immediate, the short term, and the near term, and the long term consequences of Russia will be. And I don't think he's made up his mind yet. I want to ask you about your domestic agenda. You've gotten a lot of questions about voting rights, Mr. President, but I want to ask you about black voters, one of your most loyal constituencies. Yep. I was in Congressman Clyburn's district yesterday in South Carolina. You opened this news conference talking about him. I spoke to a number of black voters who fought to get you elected, and now they feel as though you are not fighting hard enough for them and their priorities. And they told me they see this push on voting rights more as a last-minute PR push than it is a legitimate effort to get legislation passed. So what do you say to these black voters who say that you do not have their backs, as you promised on the campaign trail? I've had their back. I've had their back my entire career. I've never not had their back. And I started on the voting rights issues long, long ago. That's what got me involved in politics in the first place. And uh, I think part of the problem is, uh, um, look, there's, there's significant disagreement in every community on whether or not the timing of assertions made by people has been in the most timely way. So I'm sure that there are those who are saying that why didn't Biden push John Lewis' bill as hard as he pushed it the last month? Why did he push it six months ago as hard as he did now? Um, uh, the fact is that there is um, there's a timing that is not of one's own choice. It's somewhat dictated by events that are happening in country and around the world as to what the focus is. But part of the problem is, as well, I have not been out in the community nearly enough. I've been here an awful lot. I find myself in a situation where uh, um, I don't get a chance to look people in the eye because of both COVID and things that are happening in Washington to be able to go out and do the things that I've always been able to do pretty well, connect with people, let them take a measure of my sincerity, let them take a measure of who I am. For example, I mean, as I pointed out in South Carolina, um, you know, last time when I was chairman of the Judiciary Committee, I got the Voting Rights Act extended for 25 years, and I got strong determined to vote for it. That's what I've been doing my whole career. And so the idea that I, that, that I didn't either anticipate or because I didn't speak to it as fervently as they want me to earlier, in the meantime, I was spending a lot of time, spent hours and hours and hours talking with my colleagues on the Democratic side, trying to get them to agree that if, in fact, this occurred, if this push continued, that they would be there for John Lewis. And anyway, so, um, but I think that's a, that's a problem that is my own making by not communicating as much as I should have. Yet, you find that uh, when you deal with members of the Black Caucus and others in the, in the United States Congress, I still have very close working relationships. So it's like every community. I'm sure that there are those in the community, and I'm a, I'm a big labor guy. I'm sure there's people in labor saying, why haven't I been able to do A, B, C, or D? So it's just going to take a little bit of time. You're, you put Vice President Harris in charge of voting rights. Are you satisfied with her work 
on this issue? And can you guarantee, do you commit that she will be your running mate in 2024, provided that you run again? Yes and yes. Okay. Do you want to expand? Pardon me? Do you care to expand? On no, there's no need to. I mean, I asked the okay. question. She's going to be my running mate, number one. And number two, I did put her in charge. I think she's doing a good job. Let me ask you, big picture, particularly when you think about voting rights and the struggles you've had to unify your own party around voting rights. Unity was one of your key campaign promises. Yep. In fact, in your inaugural address, you said your whole soul was in bringing America together, uniting our people. People heard the speech that you gave on voting rights in Georgia recently, in which you described those who were opposed to you to George Wallace and Jefferson Davis, and some people took exception to that. What do you say to those who were offended by your speech, and is this country more unified than it was when you first took office? Number one, anybody who listened to the speech, I did not say that they were going to be a George Wallace or a Bull Connor. I said we're going to have a decision in history that is going to be marked just like it was then. You either voted on the side, not to make you George Wallace, or didn't make you Bull Connor. But if you did not vote for the Voting Rights Act back then, you were voting with those who agreed with Connor, those who agreed with, with and, and so, and I, I think Mitch did a real good job of making it sound like I was attacking them. If you notice, I haven't attacked anybody publicly, any senator, any, 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 any congressman publicly. And my disagreements with them have been made to them, communicated to them privately or in person with them. Uh, my desire still is, look, I underestimated one very important thing. I never thought that Republicans, like for example, I said, they got very upset. I said, there are 16 members of the present United States Senate who voted to extend the Voting Rights Act. Now, they got very offended by that. It wasn't an accusation, it's stating a fact. What has changed? What happened? What happened? Why is there not a single Republican? Not one. That's not the Republican Party. So that's not an attack. Is the country more, unif the country more unified than when you first took office? Uh, the answer is, Based on some of the stuff we've got done, I'd say yes, but it's not nearly unified as it should be. Look, I still contend, and I know you'll have a right to judge me by this, I still contend that unless you can reach consensus in a democracy, you cannot sustain the democracy. And so this is a real test, whether or not my, uh, my, my, uh, my counterpart in China is right or not. When he says autocracies are the only thing that are going to prevail because democracies take too long to make decisions and countries are too divided. I believe we're going through one of those inflection points in history that occurs every several generations or even more than that, even more time than that, where things are changing almost regardless of any particular policy. The world's changing in big ways. We're going to see, if you heard me say this before, we're going to see more change in the next 10 years than we've seen in the last 50 years because of technology, because of fundamental alterations in alliances that are occurring, not because of any one individual, just because of the nature of things. And so I think you're going to see an awful lot of transition. And the question is, can we keep up with it? Can we maintain the democratic institutions that we have, not just here, but around the world, to be able to generate democratic consensus on how to proceed? It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard, but it requires, it requires leadership to do it. And I'm not giving up on the prospect of being able to do that. Thank you. There are deep questions among Americans about the competence of government. From the messy rollout of 5G this week, to the Afghanistan withdrawal, to testing on COVID. What have you done to restore Americans' faith in the competence of government? And are you satisfied by the view of the competence of your government? Look, let's take Afghanistan. I know you all would like to focus on that, which is legitimate. We were spending a trillion dollars a week, I mean, a billion dollars a week in Afghanistan for 20 years. Raise your hand if you think anyone was going to be able to unify Afghanistan under one single government. It's been the graveyard of empires for a solid reason. It is not susceptible to unity, number one. So the question was, do I continue to spend that much money per week in the state of Afghanistan, knowing that the idea that being able to succeed other than sending more body bags back home is highly, highly unusual. My dad used to have an expression. He'd say, son, if everything's equally important to you, nothing's important to you. There is no way to get out of Afghanistan after 20 years easily. Not possible, no matter when you did it. And I make no apologies for what I did. I have a great concern for the women and men who were blown up on the line at the airport by a terrorist attack against them. But the military will acknowledge, and I think you will, who know a lot about foreign policy, that had we stayed and I had not pulled those troops out, we would be asked to put somewhere between 20 and 50,000 more troops back in. Because the only reason more Americans weren't being killed than others is because the last president signed an agreement to get out by May the 1st. And so everything was copacetic. Had we not gotten out, and the acknowledgement is we'd be putting a lot more forces in. Now, am I, do I feel badly what's happening to 
as a consequence of the incompetence of the Taliban? Yes, I do. But I feel badly also about the fistulas that are taking place in Eastern Congo. I feel badly about a whole range of things around the world that we can't solve every problem. And so I don't view that as a competence issue. The issue of whether or not there's competence in terms of whether or not we're dealing with 5G or not, we don't deal with 5G. The fact is that you had two enterprises, two private enterprises that had one promoting 5G and the other one are airlines. They're private enterprises. They have government regulation, admittedly. And so what I've done is pushed as hard as I can to have 5G folks hold up and abide by what was being requested by the airlines until they could more modernize over the years so that 5G would not interfere with the potential of the landing. So any tower, any 5G tower within a certain number of miles from the airport should not be operative. And that's, and so I understand, but anything that happens that's consequential is viewed as the government's responsibility. I get that. Am I satisfied with the way in which we have dealt with uh, um, COVID and all the things that, uh, that, that go along with that? Yeah, I am satisfied. I think we've done it remarkably well. You know, the idea that uh, on testing we've done, we should have done it quicker, but we've done remarkable since then. What we have is we have more testing going on than anywhere in the world. And we're going to continue to increase that. Did we have it at the moment exactly when we should have moved? And could we have moved a month earlier? Yeah, we could have. But with everything else that's going on, I don't view that as somehow a mark of incompetence. Look, think of what we did on COVID. When, uh, when we were pushing on uh, AstraZeneca to provide more vaccines. Well, guess what? They didn't have the machinery to be able to do it. So I physically went to Michigan stood there in a factory with the head of, the, uh, of uh, um, AstraZeneca and said, we'll provide the machinery for you. This is what we'll do. We'll help you do it so you can produce this vaccine more rapidly. I think that's pretty hands-on stuff. We also said right now, when people, the hospitalizations are, are, are overrunning hospitals and you have docs and nurses out because of COVID, they have COVID. We put thousands of people back in, in those hospitals. Look at all the, marine, all the military personnel we have there, first responders. Nobody is ever organized. Nobody is ever organized a strategic operation to get as many shots in arms by opening clinics and keeping and being able to get so many people vaccinated. What I'm doing now is not just getting significant amounts of, of vaccines to the rest of the world, but they now need the mechanical way is how they get shots in arms. So we're providing them to know how to do that. Now, should everybody in America know that? No, I don't necessarily know that. They're just trying to figure out how to put three squares on the table and stay safe. But so I, I, I do think the place where I was a little disappointed, I wish we could have written it differently, is when we did the legislation to provide the funding for COVID and the money we provided for the states to be able to deal with keeping schools open. Some of them didn't do a very good job. Some are still holding the money. I don't have the authority to do anything about that. I think that's not particularly competent. There's things that could and should have been done. They could have moved faster. So I, uh, um, I understand the frustration. You know, I, I remember 